The Ostomy Nurse Project. Thank you for listening, my little interested ostomy friends. Yes, it is the ostomy nurse back for another episode. It is my favorite episode finally today. It is the Stoma's Horrible Histories episode part one because there is so much information to pass on to you guys. I had to spread it over two episodes. I have done so much reading. You are going to love the information that I have pulled up today all about stomas and the origins of how they came about, which is basically based on miracles of nature and observing the natural healing process. Now today's episode is going to be focusing on the obviously the earlier parts of stomal history. So looking right back into ancient times and looking at the earliest publications of how damage to the intestines resulted in having to perform surgery on this organ and how that later evolved into the 18th and 19th centuries into the deliberate surgical formation or surgical fixation of the bowel to the abdomen. Just a disclaimer for anybody who is tuning into this episode for the first time, there is going to be discussion on medical procedures and I'm going to be talking about some pretty gruesome things and events that have happened throughout history. And I'm also going to be reading from certain texts which describe medical procedures in quite grave detail. So if that's not quite for you or if you happen to find that topic a little bit abhorrent and you don't want to listen to it, please feel free to tune out and tune into some of the other Ostomy Nurse episodes, uh, which are a lot less descriptive and intense in terms of talking about the functions of the bowel and injury to the bowel. So first and foremost, when we think about the uh, surgical formation of a stoma in this day and age, in present day, what we know about how stomas are formed and why stomas are surgically created is so very different from what they started out as several hundred years ago. And way back even uh, into ancient times from, you know, several hundred years into BC and, and further on, even through the Dark Ages, there would have been times when surgery was seen as a very last resort because of the absence of things things like antibiotics to save people from infection. Even anesthesia, true anesthesia in the form of ether wasn't created until only just a couple of hundred years ago. And even in the absence of proper training on anatomy and physiology of the human body was actually quite a late occurrence. And so um, the formation or injury and surgery to damaged bowel back, uh, way back then was certainly very different because it was almost a little bit like the blind leading the blind and uh, having to operate on the bowel that was uh, injured or prolapsed or herniated was often a case of uh, last resort if you had to operate on it at all. We start to see that through later in the centuries as they go by, the progression from starting as simply as uh, creating an emergency Um, opening into the bowel to save a person's life and really leaving it at that then progresses on to more knowledge about uh, how the bowel is going to function and preventing things like septic peritonitis and how people uh, throughout time have suggested creating different techniques and measures to do things like avoid infection, um, avoid peritonitis, avoid retraction of the bowel back into the body and things like that. So it really amazes me when I talk about the different surgeons and the different anatomists and the particularly remarkable people um, throughout history who have contributed to the formation of stomas that we know them as in this day and age. It's really remarkable. And you'll probably hear it when I start talking about some of these people in the podcast because some people I too talk about a lot more than others um, because I really find that their contribution to the field of surgery and the field particularly in, in stomas and creating them was really paramount in changing the way we started to think about ostomy surgery and the techniques used to create what we now know as the current stoma formation that we use, which is things like um, a nice spout, proud, pouting ileostomy, or perhaps even just the use of sutures 
to prevent the retraction of the bowel back into the body, you know, things like that. These are the things that have progressed throughout history as a means of almost trial and error when other techniques in the past have failed. And one thing I really think about when I've been reading all these historical research papers is the fact that in the current age that we live in, the way that stomas are formed now are not necessarily the gold standard technique. Way back in the years before our time of the stomas that we know now, people probably thought that their stomas were the gold standard in the technique at the time. We can really only work with what we're given, the tools that we're given. And the art of surgery as it is can really only work with the means that we've got. So for us at the moment, that's things like we can really only work with ostomy pouches that are made from a sticky hydrocolloid. What's to say in the future, you know, in another hundred years time that stomas might even be completely different? And they probably will. We probably won't even need ostomy pouches in a couple of hundred years in the future. They will have designed or even formed the ability to clone a completely new bowel and people will just have total bowel transplants or something radical like that. But in this present day and age, we can look at the stomas that we've got and we can certainly attribute that to the previous surgeons and the techniques that they used before our time that have have travelled through history and really formed what we know now and what we use now, which is really all not that different from how it used to be several hundred years ago. And you'll hear me talk about that in just a minute. All right, so let's get down to business. I want to point out the fact that the origins of the idea of stoma surgery are all basically centered around what I would call medical miracles. So people who had terrible injuries to the intestine, um, who would have previously thought to have had no hope at all back then and were probably going to die, and they somehow survived their injuries. And they went on to live despite severe damage to the bowel, even permanent external damage to the bowel. And, you know, evidence of these methods to treat these injuries date back way, way, way back into ancient times with ancient texts and writings that have traveled through history describing the tools and the means of how they repaired the wounded bowel at the time. And I guess every culture and every civilization at the time had their own techniques for doing that depending on the resources that they were given. And so I want to point out two people um, who were probably two people who published the earliest Uh, mention of intestinal repair and that was uh, Cornelius Celsus and an Indian uh, Hindu healer called Sushruta Samhita who both wrote texts back way back into several hundred years BC about how they repaired intestinal injuries at the time. Aulus Cornelius Celsus if I've pronounced that correctly, he was a Roman encyclopedist and he lived somewhere between 25 BC and AD 50. Now, he documented back then what we would know today as something like Encyclopedia Britannica or Wikipedia for millennials listening, if any of you guys are listening, but with more accuracy and probable truth. And of all the volumes that he wrote, he wrote many, many volumes, the only one thought to survive throughout history was the uh, the book called De Medicina, or On Medicine. And book seven and eight of this volume of this encyclopedia that he wrote focused entirely on surgery and surgical technique. And Celsus wrote a lot about uh, works that had already been spoken of and taught by Hippocrates, but he also went on to advance those theories and added much more detail about things like diseases and illnesses. And so he described things like the etiology, so that's the cause of these illnesses, the clinical manifestations, so the signs and symptoms of these illnesses, and also things like the relevant medical and surgical treatments for those conditions, which nothing had ever really been published a lot prior to that. Now, there's some speculation that Celsus himself was a doctor or a physician, Um, but there's no actual proof of that. But they suggested that because of the detail that he went to uh, when he was describing these procedures in his book. So as I said, there's actually no proof that he was or he wasn't a physician, which is probably more due to the fact that the Greeks ruled civilization at the time and they probably would not have publicized that a Roman was uh, a person with a profession or, or something similar to that. 
So there's, you know, a few research articles out there that debate whether he was or he wasn't. But regardless, he was the person who documented all of these these conditions and published them in his works De Medicina. And as we say in the nursing profession, if you don't document it, it did not happen or you did not do it. So fortunately for Celsus, he published these works and he compiled all of these documents of different conditions or different injuries and how they were surgically treated. And in his book, De Medicina, being the only book to survive, it was rediscovered and reprinted in 1443 when Pope Nicholas V found a copy in Milan in Italy and he he saw the true value in it and he really valued its worth and decided to republish the works. And Celsus was, was credited with the work and so De Medicina is typically considered these days the very first printed medical textbook in existence. And up until the 19th century, there were more than 60 editions of the book De Medicina published in Latin and in many other languages also. Now, the concept of stoma didn't really exist back then to what we know it as now. But even from that very first medical textbook, De Medicina, there were documented cases of intestinal injury with the relevant treatment strategies listed for these ailments. And they even have pictures, you know, artist impression pictures of the surgical tools used to repair these injuries. And what's really amazing is that the surgical treatment for those injuries that were published way back then really isn't much different to the current day surgical procedures that they use to do bowel resections or even hernia repairs or, you know, fixing perforations in the bowel. It's really not different at all. So here's an excerpt in a shortened version from Book 8 of De Medicina describing the surgical repair of an abdominal stab wound because obviously there was a lot of battles going on back then. And so uh, Celsus published the surgical repair of an abdominal stab wound with an intestinal prolapse as a result of that. Sometimes the abdomen is penetrated by a stab of some sort, and it follows that the intestines roll out. When this happens, we must first examine whether they are uninjured, and then whether their proper colour persists. The larger intestine can be sutured, not with any certain assurance, but because a doubtful hope is preferable to certain despair, for occasionally it heals up. Then, if either te- intestine is livid or pallid or black, in which cases there is necessarily no sensation and all medical aid is in vain. The patient is to be laid on his back with his hips raised, and if the wound is too narrow for the intestines to be easily replaced, it is to be cut until sufficiently wide. If the intestines have already become too dry, they are to be bathed in water. So Celsus has not only introduced a method for curing stab wounds with a prolapsed intestine hanging out, but he's also highlighted some important basic principles of abdominal surgery. And so things like recognizing ischemic bowel as being black or dark or dusky, knowing that that's a dire situation and that piece of bowel will die if it's not replaced back into the body or if it's not removed and cut back to restore blood supply to the healthy bowel. These are the things that he recognized even back then, you know, in, in those ages when surgery really is, was nowhere near what it is now. And then, as I mentioned earlier, Sushruta Samita, who was the the Hindu doctor, wrote in his texts, which was around 600 BC, that traumatic intestinal wounds could actually be closed with the pincers of black ants, with cleansing compresses to reinsert the intestine back into the body. So even all across the world, there was people who were documenting or, or teaching cases of how to repair an injured or perforated bowel. I mean, using black ants and their pincers was genius, really, compared to the surgical staples that we use now. But it shows the process of thinking that the technique was not all that different. They were using it to staple the bowel shut uh, and to reinsert the intestine back into the body, which is really what we do these days. Obviously, the the methods and the instruments that they had at the time were a little bit less substandard than what we've got now. And so shortly after this time, there was a bit of a pause in in documented texts and education and publication about surgery. 
the rise of the Dark Ages, which you've probably heard of, uh, saw a, a, a very long pause in documented anatomical dissection studies and medical procedures and their, you know, their, their profession of teaching that due to a lot of things. And, and one of those in particular was the religious presence that condemned the practice of medicine as probably witchcraft and, and heresy. But, you know, as the years went by, the Renaissance movement came in towards the end and it sort of moved on from these religious and public prohibitions that prevented the progress of medicine and at that point we started to see a turn in a lot more publication and teachings about the human body and these procedures so as the years went by the concept of intestinal injury would still carry with it an almost certainty of death but the more people were coming forward and starting to research and explore through, you know, dissection and exploring of cadaver bodies, dead bodies, learning about the human body, um, the knowledge started to progress. And so for several hundred years, it would still be the belief that anybody who injured their large bowel would have, you know, a fair chance or slim but possible chance of survival. Whereas any damage to the small intestine was still largely considered inevitably fatal. And that would carry on for hundreds of years. And many medical professionals would hold this belief right up until the very late 19th century, when the first deliberate ileostomy was created in 1879. Now, I'm not going to get to ileostomies probably until part two of the episode or perhaps at the end of this episode because they were starting to create them so late in the piece compared to the timeline of stomas now. If you've ever listened to the first three episodes of different stoma types uh, in the colostomy, ileostomy and neurostomy episodes, I do talk a little bit about the fact that the colostomy is probably the oldest of the stomas, whereas ileostomy came after that and neurostomy finally came well after that or the procedure that we know it as now. So most of the documentation in these early years was of the large intestine because many people often didn't operate on the small intestine through fear that it would cause septic peritonitis. And finally, as these years went by and the Renaissance came through and there was more research and dissection and ex exploration of the body, these publications started to come out again. And I'm going to talk about three different figures here because at the time of the resurgence of medical publishing and the practice of surgery and medicine, several figures, key figures, can be credited with the first published cases of intestinal repair. And they were due to things like battle wounds and hernias, ruptured hernias. And so the three pe the four people, sorry, that I want to talk about is George Arnold, Henri Ledran, Lorenz Eister, and William Cheseldon. And I'm going to talk about these four people and the differences in how they they influenced the concept of, of abdominal surgery at the time and the slight variations in their history and, and the things that they talked about in their publications that were slightly different from the other and how that all contributed to the improvement of surgical technique for intestinal injury. So many of the ways that surgeons at the time learnt about uh, injuries to the bowel was through battle. There was a lot of wars going on at the time. And in particular, Henri Ledran and Lorenz Heister were military surgeons. And so they both spent time in war and were able to observe horrendous battle wounds, especially to the abdomen where intestines were spilling out and, and large stab and, and you know, bayonet wounds to the abdomen were causing these horrendous injuries. And so they were able to observe both on the living soldiers and the dead uh, how to operate on these organs. Whereas for people like George Arnold and uh, William Cheseldon, who were more sort of almost academic uh, in their works and the things that they learned about were not necessarily solely from war. Yes, there would have been an element to it, but their backgrounds were slightly different. Georges de Roncille Arnaud, that's my best French accent, was one of the first French surgeons to publish his works on surgical procedures for curing hernias. He was actually a hernia surgeon. Now, he was born in 1698, and he came from a very long line of French surgeons, dating back several hundred years. So it was all in the family to him, and, and I'm pretty sure they actually all worked on hernia repairs. He probably learnt 
most of his techniques from his family line through apprenticeship and teachings. And he noted in one of his books, a dissertation on hernias or ruptures, the imminent danger of a strangulated or incarcerated hernia and the need for surgical intervention. So for those of you who don't know, or for those of you who have ever had one, a strangulated or incarcerated hernia, um, a hernia is obviously where a piece of the bowel slips through a hole in the abdomen. Okay. Now, if enough bowel slips through that hole in the abdominal wall, we get a bulge. That's the lump that we see. And we can get all different types of hernias. We can get inguinal hernias down in the groin. We can get umbilical hernias, incisional hernias, ventral hernias. The, the concept is still the same. A section of bowel or a loop of bowel slips through a hole in the abdominal wall. And that then continues on and can get bigger or smaller. And that's a hernia. In cases where the bowel sticks out too far through that hole, if the area swells up or if too much bowel gets in, the blood supply or the hole can be so tight around that bowel that it can get strangulated and it can cut off the blood supply. And that actually causes the piece of bowel that is stuck in that pouch to die. And that's very painful and you can get um, very bad infections and you can even die from them. And a lot of people back in these days, in the 1700s, did die from hernias. So uh, George Arnold, he wrote in his dissertation, between 1722 and 1736, he published many, many articles. But some case studies that he put forward, and I'm going to mention two of them in particular, in one case of hernia repair... He operated on an obese maiden of the Duchess of Orleans who had a hernia so large that the skin was almost transparent and fit to burst. The hernia contained both large and small bowel plus some peritoneum and omentum as well. So it really kind of had all the abdominal linings that had slipped into this huge hernia on this very obese woman. Now Arnold was able to surgically reduce the hernia and he talks about that in his case study, which I'm not going to quote from yet. But the point is, the lady later on gorged herself on food and wine and actually died 17 days after surgery from probable fecal perforation and septic peritonitis. But she did survive the surgery. She just happened to die a couple of weeks later because she decided to eat and drink. Now, Arnaud uh, wrote a second case in his dissertation, and that was a particularly interesting case because it included the hernia that involved the small bowel. So in October of 1733, Arnaud operated on a 45-year-old woman with an incarcerated small bowel hernia. And due to the adhesions and severe strangulation within the hernia, Arnaud chose to open the intestine, which is a practice not generally recommended in, in many cases back then. And it was this case that Arnaud described performing an enterotomy or a cut into the intestine that he pulled outwards from the abdomen to evacuate the effluent externally instead of the risk of spillage into the abdomen. Sound familiar? Even more interestingly, Arnaud described the means by which he was able to secure the intestine without letting it slip back into the abdomen. And you're going to enjoy this case. And, and I quote from his dissertation as follows. I cut all at once and with a single stroke. Immediately upon this, the bilious matter was discharged so copiously as to convince me that the hole was sufficiently dilated and to give me reason to hope that the faeces would be evacuated through that aperture. I dressed the wound with a pledget dipped in a digestive, composed of the liniment of Archaeus and oil of St. John's wort. This pledget was secured by a plaster, which permitted the evacuation of the faeces. We took care to change the dressing every time the abdomen discharged its contents. The evacuations were so considerable on the first day that the dressing had but very small time to remain on the wound, but they were diminished every day after till the sixth when the wound was entirely deterged. Then, in the room of the digestive, I substituted the venom melitum or oil of St. John's wort. I use these remedies alternatively every other day or every two days, according to the crispation or irritation which the former remedy produced, or according to the too great relaxation occasioned 
by the oil. The intestine was gradually retracted till the fifteenth day, when it appeared almost on a level with the skin, so that we could hardly distinguish the aperture of it. At the end of a month the faeces ceased to be discharged from the wound, which was cicatrized on the fortieth day. Okay, so just to clarify a few ye olde terms that he uses in these case studies, because these were written in 1733, uh, the use of a pledget dipped in a digestive uh, with the liniment of Archaeus or oil of St. John's wort. That was basically another way of saying that they used to get a little wound up piece of cloth, dipped it in something that was antimicrobial, so either wine or, um, you know, like a tree root infusion, anything that was considered antiseptic at the time, and they would place that on uh, over that wound. And then he also talks about um, using to secure it a use of a plaster, which is really not that difficult. It's just another word for plaster at the time. But he was a Frenchman, so that's probably how it meant at the same time. And Arnaud's operation for reducing incarcerated hernias almost typifies the current day surgical procedure for bowel stomas, if you note the similarities between them. The only part lacking from today's procedures, as opposed to what he was doing back then, is the lack of suturing to the external abdomen and securing the piece of intestine in place with sutures. The necessity of opening the bowel was only considered an option back then when there was no other available, so they probably didn't think uh, to secure it as a permanent fixture or even a, a longer-term fixture at the time. The idea would have been to close it as soon as possible. But Arnold didn't. He, As he wrote, he he just put compresses on it and dressed it. Every time uh, the effluent came out, they would replace the dressing. And eventually, that incarcerated hernia that had been opened spontaneously healed and closed itself over that wound, which was, you know, the way that things healed at the time. At the same time as George Arnold was practicing in Paris, surgeons like Henri Ledran and Lorenz Heister were developing their experiences from joining the war efforts and becoming military surgeons. So they were treating battle wounds and examining dead soldiers as part of their education towards anatomy and surgical techniques. And there's a particular reference to a gentleman called George Depp, who sustained an abdominal wound uh, at the Battle of Ramillies in 1706. And as a result of his wound, he developed what we would call now a collocutaneous fistula, which healed into a sort of a loop colostomy and the colostomy was said to prolapse significantly particularly when he was having a bowel motion and then it would sort of suck back in a little bit but George Depp survived his original battle wound and lived for 14 years with a colostomy albeit a spontaneously formed one and if you go to the Royal Society website you can actually see a painting or an artist impression of the documented colostomy that George Depp lived with and it's really, really amazing to see. You can jump on the website to this day. It's uh, the royalsociety.co.uk. And it the picture shows the colostomy that's complete with what looks like to be granulomas and, and everything. The detail is really great. But it was a true testament to the terrible wounds that soldiers sustained in battle. And yet how miraculously some of them survived after sustaining these injuries. Now, Henri Ledran, who I just mentioned before, Ledran's experience and publications on intestinal injury and hernia were very similar to Arnaud's. Ledran was also a French surgeon. Uh, however, as a military surgeon who'd witnessed abdominal wounds in battle and prolapsing of the intestines as a result, his textbook work, named The Operations in Surgery, included using a suture, as I just mentioned before, to secure the external intestine to the skin. And that prevented it from retracting and spilling effluent inside the abdominal wound, causing infection. Other accounts actually describe how the spontaneously healed stomas affected the skin around the wounds. And there were some really early documentations of the very first skin irritations, which people to this day still suffer from in this day and age, even with the, the current ostomy pouches and, and the importance that we've placed on skin irritation, it still exists. And so in Ledran's text, which I'm going to quote from now, it might have been one of the first incidences of publishing comments about peristomal skin irritations. He says, In the space of a month, 
the excrements that continually discharged by the wound and spread over the dressings caused an erysipelas with an excoriation upon the belly and thigh. This was moderated in a few days by the application of compresses dipped in a quart of brandy and three quarts of water with a little copperas and verdigris in the composition. At the length of the cicatrice advanced and the skin united into the circumference of the extremity of the intestine that left an anus in the groin through which the excrements were evacuated. In short, the patient left the hospital in two months' time and was received into the invalids. So even back then, in the early parts of the 1700s, these surgeons like Henri Ledran and George Arnaud were operating on people. And really, even though they were technically just fixing bowel injuries and uh, making incisions into hernias, they really were creating, in effect, the earliest forms of colostomy. But they just didn't call it that at that stage. Now, Lorenz Heister was coined as the father of surgery in Germany, and he obtained his MD at the University of Hardwick in May of 1708. So all these people, all these surgeons were sort of living in the, around the same time throughout Europe. And after finishing his studies, he went to Amsterdam, which at the time in the early 1700s was one of the few places where anatomy could be studied by practical dissection. So cadavers exploring dead bodies. You couldn't do that in many of the other European countries. He also served as an army surgeon in Flanders, where he may or may not have been introduced to other British surgeons, but it's likely that he was, because army surgeons who cared for wounded soldiers on battlefields were fully aware of knowing how important it was to uh, understand anatomy. And so they would get together in between the wars that were happening. They would travel to the other countries um, and get connected to other surgeons and become inner circles of society. And, and they really advocated for the anatomic dissection of these bodies, um, in particular of executed criminals as well. Now, Heister later visited Britain and would have seemed to have made friends there possibly with William Cheselton, who I'm going to talk about in a minute. They were of similar age to each other and they were both studying the same profession. But what was really interesting in Heister's texts that he published, he commented on the importance of keeping the intestine outside of the abdomen to prevent contamination and peritonitis. He really focused on that in his publications, the importance of if the bowel is mortified or if it's dying, it's better to allow it to burst outside the body because if it was left to perforate within the abdomen, the person would surely die from infection. He's also credited for suggesting that the, and I quote, the lips of the intestine so wounded would sometimes adhere to the wound of the abdomen, and therefore there seemed no reason why we should not take hints from nature. Now that's a really great comment because no truer words were spoken. Because inevitably as generations went on, the deliberate formation of stomas was essentially mimicking the body's own ability to heal around an external wound whilst continuing to discharge faecal matter through that exit, whilst the person continued to live. Um, and that, that's what really highlights the fact that these surgeons were recognising that these bodies are healing on their own without a lot of intervention. And so if these patients are surviving, perhaps we should be able to create that or recreate that circumstance in other areas or for other illnesses. Now, before I start talking about William Cheselden, I want to mention at this point um, the publications by a gentleman called Alexis Latre, who some years before Heister's statement um, about the ability of the body to heal up and create its own stoma, he proposed that the deliberate formation of a colostomy could cure infants of imperforate anus or anal atresia. And that would be a procedure that would not actually be performed successfully until nearly a century later. Alexis Luttre was a French physician and anatomist, remember those titles. He was born in Cordes Tolosins in France. And in 1699, he also became a member of the Académie des Sciences, so the Academy of Science. And he taught anatomy and was one of the authors of numerous medical publications at the time. And he was the first to give a description of a hernial protrusion of an intestinal diverticulum. And that condition nowadays is referred to as a Littre's hernia. So he was quite popular at the time. 
Alexis Luttre did not perform a colostomy himself because he was a physician and an anatomist, and I'll talk about that later, but he essentially suggested two solutions for treating anal atresia or imperforate anus as he had encountered this condition in a post-mortem. And the first suggestion was to open the closed ends, so the parts that weren't connected with a trocar, which is still a medical term used these days. It's basically like a big spike. If anybody's ever had laparoscopic surgery, the big spikes that they put into your abdomen to insert the cameras, they are trocars. Same thing. So his first suggestion was to use a trocar to open the closed end and stitch the bowel to that newly created anus in the correct position. The second option was to create an artificial anus, and this became known as the Littre operation. And that procedure would not be undertaken until late in the 18th century when Dubois would perform an inguinal colostomy for an imperforate anus on a three-day-old baby that unfortunately died 10 days later. So way, way back at the very start of the 18th century, so 1710, Alexis Luttre was talking about the idea of deliberately creating a stoma. So the idea was implanted and there were surgeons out there who were sort of seemingly creating them by accident, but the actual first deliberate one wouldn't be done until about 80 or 90 years after that suggestion. So that's pretty amazing. Now, William Cheselden was born on October 19, 1688, at Summerby in Leicestershire. He became a surgeon in 1718 and was probably most well known for his operation on kidney stones. So he invented the technique of removing them uh, from the side instead of suprapubically. But he was probably considered one of the greatest surgeons in Europe during the 18th century. And one of his most famous published works was Anatomy of the Human Body, first published in 1713, and it became an important textbook going through 16 English and American editions up until 1806, so almost throughout 100 years. And now probably the part that most of us stoma nurses would have heard about is the story of Margaret White. Um, So probably the earliest, most famous published document of stoma surgery was by Cheselden, and it was the story of Margaret White, who's the lady depicted on the cover logo of this very podcast. If any of you have ever paid attention to the logo, anybody, the lady bending over the chair is an image of Margaret White with her clothing held up and her umbilical colostomy protruding from her abdomen. Now, it's unlikely that Margaret White's case was the first colostomy ever created for a ruptured hernia because I've just read you several other case studies where where that has been done. However, Given the articulate detail in the case and the circumstances with which a senior citizen or a pensioner basically was able to access such a revered surgeon makes the case much, much more interesting to me. And I'll talk about that in a minute when I explain about Cheselden's influence on separating the Guild of Barber Surgeons into separate professions later on in his career. Now, also, when researching this case, it's been documented in some published articles that Cheselden operated on Margaret White in, you know, some years, even up to like 1756. But Cheselden actually died in 1752. So from reading and from previous research, we've sort of narrowed down Margaret White's surgery to around about the early 1720s. It's hard to know exactly, but I think it's around about that time that she uh, was operated on by William Cheselden. And there is several different publications of the Margaret White case in in different journals and articles. But what I did find was a digitized copy of Cheselden's chapter published in 1723 named A Treatise on the High Operation for the Stone. Now, Margaret White's operation has nothing to do with kidney stones, but it is mentioned in his book and his publication about her case in which he does mention Margaret White. Anyway, I will read to you as it is written in this particular version, the 1723 version. And I quote, The case of Margaret White, the wife of John White, a pensioner at the Fishmonger's Almshouses at Newington in Surrey, who, in her 50th year of her age, had a rupture at her navel, which continued till her 73rd year, when after a fit of the colic, it mortified, and the being presently after taken with a vomiting, it burst. I went to her and found her in this condition with about six and twenty inches and a half of the gut hanging out and mortified. I took away what was mortified and left the end of the found gut hanging out at the navel 
to which it was afterwards adhered, and she recovered. It is now above a year since this accident happened, and she continues perfectly well, voiding her excrements through the intestine at the navel. And though the ulcer was so large after the mortification separated that the breadth of two guts was seen, yet they never at any time protruded out of the wound, though she was taken out of her bed and sat up every day. Now, although it was established that Cheseldon operated on Margaret White and created a, a stoma by cutting away the necrotic piece of colon from her, her abdomen, Margaret's body had kind of already done a lot of the work. And by the time she was operated on, the hernia had already ruptured to the outside. And so in a way, she was really lucky because by already having the bowel protruding so much from her abdomen, when it ruptured or when it perforated, there was less contamination inside her, her belly, which probably saved her life in essence. If it had perforated and spilled internally, she would have likely developed peritonitis and died of infection. So yes, Cheseldon created an, basically an inadvertent form of a colostomy, but it was more of an emergency situation and not a deliberate or planned surgical technique. Now Cheseldon went on to become so well respected that he was even appointed surgeon to Queen Caroline, who was the wife of King George II in 1727. He even dedicated one of his other books, Osteographica, to her. Other patients during his time included Alexander Pope, Sir Hans Sloan, and even Sir Isaac Newton. So he was pretty popular in Europe and England at the time. However, it was the story of Queen Caroline's death 10 years later that kind of broke my heart. And that brings us back to Cheseldon's career and why he was actually not present in the final hours of her excruciating death. It was horrendous. The Queen had suffered an umbilical hernia following the birth of Princess Louise, who was her last child of 10. 10! Ten pregnancies and eight live births. This was probably the reason that her abdominal wall had weakened um, and that she developed a hernia after ten children. And I don't think Kegels were invented back then to build any muscle tone. Then on November 9th, 1737, the Queen fell ill during a royal event and she was taken to her bed where the now royal doctor, John Ranby, was called to review her. And despite the Royal Society's recommendations, of which both Cheseldon and Ramby were members of, to repair hernias without cutting, John Ramby cut off part of the diseased bowel instead of pushing it back inside and sewing her up. And horrifically, these operations continued daily for a while. And two weeks later, on the 17th of November, the Queen's strangulated hernia eventually burst, leaving her in severe pain and excreting faecal matter from her abdomen for three days before her death. Queen Caroline passed away in the evening of the 20th of November at St. James Palace, holding King George's hand after saying goodbye to her children. Now, it's thought that the Queen was not particularly fond of John Ramby, with reports of her calling him a blockhead and laughing at he and his assistant during one particular surgery where one of their wigs set fire in the candlelight, because that's how surgery was done back then. There was no electricity, so they had to do everything by a tiny little dim candlelight. And she would not have been in charge of employing staff to the royal court. But these statements that she was said to have made may have been the result of many things. Possibly the amount of pain she was in for living with daily operations and a ruptured hernia. Um, possibly the amount of opium and alcohol that they would have given her as a form of analgesia or sedation. Or even possibly due to sepsis and delirium, she might have developed as a result of the perforated bowel. But the question in my head always remained of why William Cheseldon, a more senior surgeon who had been in court um, to treat her, was not called upon to treat the Queen in such a state at the time of her death. If he had have been consulted, it's possible that there might have been a different result to the illness. For prior to that day, Cheseldon had published an interesting account of a successful operation for that particular condition. He'd already written about successful cases. So why had William Cheseldon fallen out of favour with the Queen? There's a story that he offended the court by delaying the execution of a criminal who had been condemned to death. William Cheseldon had requested to perforate the eardrum of that prisoner who was actually deaf. And he wanted to do this to examine whether the eardrum was actually responsible for hearing and whether perforating that could uh, 
affect deafness or possibly even cure deafness. And Cheserin in his anatomy book tells the story as follows of why um, he thought he had fallen out of favour with the court. And I quote, Some years since a malefactor was pardoned on condition that he suffered this experiment, but the falling ill of a fever, the operation was deferred, during which time there was so great a public clamour raised against it that it was afterwards thought fit to be forbid. So that proposing the operation rather than neglecting to do it was more probably the offence. William Cheseldon was known as a very jovial and friendly man. He was, he was quite genial in, in all the reports. And he was often seen to be kind to the poor and was fairly non-discriminate in those that he treated. So it's possible that the royal court suspected that he used the proposed operation to secure the man's pardon from death only to then delay the operation, which made them think that he was only suggesting the idea of it to save the man's life. And that would have caused them much embarrassment. And we'll never really know why he ended up falling out of favour, but true to form, it begs to differ why he was not present at the, the death of Queen Caroline. Even though John Ramby probably tried his best to operate on her, it was non-successful and, and she died. And that's quite a famous, horrific case of her death. The descriptions of her her painful death and her hernia rupture was a lot more descriptive, so I've dulled it down a little bit for the purpose of the podcast. Now, the other reason I really admire William Cheseldon was his role in progressing the medical profession and essentially bringing together the art of surgery and the practice of medicine. So in England, barbers and surgeons uh, originally had separate guilds. Uh, but these were merged by Henry VIII in 1540 as the United Barber Surgeons Company. Okay, time for our next fun fact for the day. Barber surgeons. Barber surgeons, as I said, were part of the same guild. The barber that we know today is not the barber that used to be around back then. So barber surgeons were effectively like the GPs of their time. So they did everything. They looked after cosmetic parts of the body, um, like they did obviously the shaving and the haircuts. But the work that they did was often during war times. So they actually even did major operations like amputations, reducing dislocations, looking at people's ulcers on the surface of the body and things like that. So lancing boils, bloodletting, all that sort of stuff. And in particular, barber surgeons at the time had a major role in treating syphilis, which pretty much everyone had back in the day. It was pretty rampant during the 16th and 17th centuries, at least. And so quite literally, the doctors of the time, the physicians, I suppose, wouldn't want to go anywhere near syphilis because it was completely beneath them. So barber surgeons were also known for doing those nasty jobs that nobody ever really liked to do. And that's really how the trade of a surgeon began and it was seen as a lesser profession. And I'm going to talk about that very shortly about how William Cheseldon changed that and brought that together. But there was essentially the group of barber surgeons as a trade and the groups of surgeons who actually wanted to be more like physicians. They wanted to do more with their surgery, but being trapped in the barber slash surgeon role, they weren't allowed to do certain things. And so they fought inevitably to separate the two and even to this day uh, right up until probably about the 1950s the barber shop was a place for almost like a pharmacy style shop yes people would go there to get their shaving and their haircuts and that sort of thing but you could even get certain medications and pills and things like that from from your barber right up until that time so even though the barber surgeons guild disbanded way back in 1745 um, the practice still went on and there was a lot of crossover between the two professions um, which is very different to what we know it as now where barbers are basically just hairdressers so that was your other fun fact for the day barber surgeons used to be barbers they used to do surgical procedures and then they graduated on to become a bit more professional and the, the trade turned into an academic profession mix or a blend. So back to William Cheseldon, he was almost the perfect medium in between these barber surgeons and these physicians, having the technical skill of a barber surgeon, but with the anatomical knowledge and reputation of a highly respected professional, even though he was still just a surgeon, so much that he was instrumental in separating the company of barber surgeons into separate entities. And if it wasn't for this separation, 
barbers would possibly still be performing surgical procedures to this day instead of actual surgeons now, who are more closely linked to physicians these days than barbers. And the Barber Surgeons Company, of which Cheselden was the first elected warden, had come to the conclusion that it would be impossible to advance or merge surgical apprenticeship with anatomical and medical education, which the physicians got, until the two bodies were separated. Surgery was pretty much a trade at the time that you learnt through apprenticeship and training, with the doctors of medicine and the physicians considered the actual professionals. And there were bylaws that existed at the time that prevented the knowledge of anatomy from spreading outside of a university-style facility. You weren't allowed to, to learn in a university unless you were accepted to do your MD as a physician. So physicians and doctors who were the academics of the medical profession at the time were concerned that the technical skill of barber surgeons would eventually outweigh the physician's knowledge and they, they got scared and they thought that they would become superfluous and they wouldn't be needed one day, that they'd end up redundant. And so they made it a penalty of £10 to dissect a body out of the university hall without permission, which was difficult to be obtained if you wanted permission anyway. And if anybody offended, as they called it, so committed that crime, they were to be prosecuted and they were prosecuted. Eventually, on May the 2nd, 1745, with William Cheselden's help, the Company of Barber Surgeons was disbanded, forming separate companies, with the Company of Surgeons going on to now be known in this day and age as the Royal College of Surgeons. Interestingly, it was John Ramby, who was the one that operated on Queen Caroline, who was appointed the first master of the Company of Surgeons, not William Cheselden. He got appointed in the second year. Now, that could have been a little bit of a, hey, thank you, John Ranby, for helping me get this through Parliament, or it could have been a bit of a nod to the King, King George, uh, basically saying, hey, thanks for passing this law and allowing us to improve our skill. Now, time for one more fun fact. I know I'm pushing you guys with all the fun facts today because it's so much fun, but I wanted to tell you about the story between GPs and physicians and surgeons. Have you ever wondered why a GP or physician is called a doctor and why a surgeon or consultant is referred to as a Mr. or Ms. or Mrs.? So it actually relates to everything that I've just mentioned with the separation of surgeons into the Guild of Surgeons and the academic physicians who were distinguished by the possession of a university medical degree or an MD. The possession of a medical degree entitled physicians only and no other medical practitioner to be addressed as doctor. So you had to be a physician to be addressed as doctor. 18th century surgeons who were, of course, addressed as Mr. seldom had any formal qualification, except in the case of the few who were the new members of the Company of Surgeons. And after the founding of the Royal College of Surgeons in London in 1800, roughly, it was customary for surgeons to take an examination for membership to the Royal College of Surgeons. So that was so that they could put the MRCS after their name, if you've ever seen that on doctor's credentials. Surgeons eventually became so proud to be distinguished from physicians that the title of Mr. kind of became a bit of a badge of honour and is still somewhat considered today. So the fact that you are known as a Mr. or a consultant who might use their, their name and, and the, the prefix Mr. is sort of like um, a nod to the profession. They're proud of that title now. Physicians with the title of doctor were gentlemen with a university education who examined and diagnosed and prescribed treatments for individuals. And the surgeons were generally the ones who undertook their bidding. But eventually the profession became so important that the two are generally regarded as equal these days. But they often keep several titles to this day. So there you go. That's my final fun fact for this episode. I'm not going <laughs> to pile you on with any more. But that's really cool. That's why. So finally, coming back to William Cheselden again, I know. What was it that I believe impacted the progression of stoma surgery itself? Yes, he was a great surgeon, but how did he affect stoma surgery? He was the first man to really see that there was a demand and a true need for scientific surgical education, not just uh, for a physician. 
he strived for the regular clinical teaching of students in hospitals, and he made the study of anatomy and physiology a necessary study for medical students, exactly the same way that medical students and nurses study it now. We all study anatomy and physiology uh, in our courses, and we see it as a foundation study, even in the very first years of our college degrees. And Cheselden regularly lectured on these topics and provided the necessary textbooks, which are the ones that he published. Um, and William Cheselden eventually passed away from a likely stroke on April the 10th, 1752. And he's currently buried on the grounds of the Chelsea Hospital in England. His legacy of creating the neosurgeon title as a new profession, really, created a wave of revered medical practitioners who went on to explore and develop newer, more accurate methods of treating colorectal diseases and bowel injury. And that's evident when I discuss the next group of surgeons who emerged in the late 1700s after Cheselden's death that would go on to pioneer new methods of forming a deliberately created colostomy. So with the new amalgamation of surgery and academia, colostomy surgery soon became more frequently documented towards the latter years of the 18th century. And although it was still only performed as a matter of life or death, it was performed by more and more European surgeons for patients who would certainly have died if not treated with a deliberate operation. Now, as previously mentioned, Alexis Latre's first suggestion way back in 1710 that an operation should be done for the condition of imperforate anus wasn't carried out. So remember when I said that Latre was a French physician, he was an anatomist, he was not a surgeon. So he was able to suggest it and, and diagnose these conditions. But he was not the person who necessarily undertook that job himself. But this is where we start to see in the late part of the 1700s, this stream of surgeons coming through and publishing all their attempts to perfect the techniques that surgeons like Cheselden and Arnaud and Ladran and Heister had all started to introduce in the early parts of the century. And they started churning out all these documents and, and attempts to fix problems like an intestinal blockage or imperforate anus or all of these terribly crippling conditions where patients would be dying if not for surgical intervention. So Pilor in 1776 in Rouen, in France, adopted the idea of Alex Luttre. Um, he didn't actually do the operation how Littre had suggested it, which is uh, at the very end of the colon, so an inguinal colostomy. But what he did was performed the first cecostomy, so an uh, incision into the cecum, which is the first part of the large intestine for anybody who's listened to other podcasts. And he did that for an occlusion of the colon. Colostomy was also performed by several surgeons uh, for patients with imperforate anus, like I just said. So Dubois in 1783, Duret in 1793, Dumas 1797, Allen 1797 and Martin in 1798. This really short space of time had a lot of surgeons who were attempting these techniques um, because they were all collaborating together after having this proper university style education and their thorough understanding of anatomy and physiology. The first transverse colostomy, so transverse across the top of the colon, for an intestinal occlusion in an adult was done by Fine in 1797. Freer of Birmingham in 1815 performed the first left inguinal colostomy in England, not in the world, but in England, for an infant who had imperforate anus. And then later in 1818, he did the same thing for an intestinal occlusion. Pring in 1821 performed the same procedure for an obstructing cancer high in the rectum and reported this case and Freer's two cases. So he was progressing uh, these procedures and Pring felt that the formation of an artificial anus for his patient, and I quote, had afforded her a moral as well as a physical advantage for she is now at no loss for an interest and is provided with something to think of for the rest of her life. So going back to Dubois and Duret, earlier on when I said Alexis Littre first suggested the inguinal colostomy way back in 1710, it's believed that the actual first performed colostomy on an infant using his method was done in 1783 by a Parisian surgeon, Antoine Dubois, and he did that on a three-day-old infant 
who was born with an imperforate anus, so born with no bottom, which is also called anal atresia. But the child died on the 10th post-operative day. So while he performed it, it was not necessarily a successful procedure. Now, some 10 years later, which is actually quite a significant gap in the timeline of colostomies, as I've just mentioned, but in 1793, Dure, a French naval surgeon, performed the second documented inguinal colostomy, like the Latre method, and was actually the first successful loop colostomy, also in the treatment of imperforate anus or anal atresia on a three-day-old infant. It was also suggested that Dure was one of several surgeons to first suggest stoma irrigation to empty the colon. And if anyone wants more information on colostomy irrigation, please tune into the podcast episode coming up that's dedicated to colostomy irrigation. There's going to be a whole episode on it. But in a nutshell, colostomy irrigation involves passing a water enema into the colon via a stoma to stimulate the bowel to contract and empty all of its contents. It's basically colonic irrigation just through in a different entry. So with more frequent surgeries being performed, there was still the pressing issue of death that was caused by peritonitis and sepsis. And the perception of small bowel injury was still deemed at this time as fatal in most cases, and so was largely avoided. But many surgeons would start making suggestions as to an alternative to operating via the peritoneum, so entering the abdominal space through the front. And they were devising methods to spare patients from such a painful and slow death. And it wouldn't be until 1839 that creating a colostomy via entering the posterior flank, so the lumbar colostomy, would be successfully performed and described by Jeanne Amosa. Now, back in the later part of the 1700s, in 1798, the concept of a lumbar-style colostomy or a colostomy through the back entry, um, through the posterior flank, was actually described by Callison. But it wouldn't be until about 40 years later that Amasar decided to try this procedure and perform it and document it and publish it and his findings on doing a lumbar colotomy at the time, as it was known. It wasn't a colostomy back then, it was a colotomy. Jean Zulema Amasar was born November 21, 1796. He was the son of a physician and received his basic tutelage at the hands of his father, so he learned everything he knew from his father, and another surgeon in the town. He joined the army at the age of 17, so young, uh, in a position equivalent to today's medic and performed many battlefield operations during the Napoleonic Wars. He became quite knowledgeable in anatomy by dissecting the corpses of Russian soldiers. I can't even think, travelling through at night time and cutting open dead bodies to find out what we're made of. Throughout his life, he placed a great emphasis on anatomic dissection as the primary means of training a surgeon. So he was instrumental in supporting Cheseldon's theory of being able to dissect bodies to learn. And one of the most notable credits Amosar gained was being the first to publish and describe an alternate surgical technique for creating a colostomy. Due to the high-risk nature of creating stomas in the litra fashion, which is the iliac colostomy, Amusa proposed opening a lumbar incision to access the large bowel, avoiding the peritoneum and the risk of sepsis. The article that I'll now quote from is translated from French, and it represents the initial description of the colostomy as devised by Amusa for an obstructing carcinoma of the rectum. And I quote, Madame D, initial D, Born in Nantes, 48 years of age, living in Paris since the age of 15, of a healthy constitution whose periods began at age 11, married at age 14, had three children during the first three years of her marriage, and was in perfect health until she became an adult. No one in her family had a history of cancer. 14 years ago, she developed stomach aches for which she received medication for gastritis. Leeches were applied in the epigastric region. The abdominal cramps persisted very strongly for up to 48 hours in duration. She stated that the pains were so severe that it was as if someone were cutting her intestines with a knife. On May 31st, 1839, I was asked by Dr. Barra to see the patient. For an incidence of abdominal cramping had increased. She developed severe abdominal pains as if she were in labour. 
Olive oil was then introduced deeply into the rectum with a curved cannula. I tried hard to inject it, but was unsuccessful. The rectum was distended, but the liquid returned without results. That evening, the same method was employed, but still without success. The patient was exhausted from the pain and the effort. It appeared that she was in great danger. We decided to have a consultation the next day, and on June 1st, Monsieur Recomier, Fouquier, Brechet, Barat, Pouilleux, and I got together for a consultation. After a thorough examination, we unanimously agreed that there was a strangulation above the rectum. Some attributed the obstruction to a tumour of the uterus, and others to a proximal tumour of the colon. Her abdomen was hard and distended. The patient had severe cramps during which she was vomiting, and she was asking continuously for an operation which could relieve her pain. Immediately after exploration and a short discussion took place, the operation was unanimously agreed upon. I must here recognise the help of the numerous consultants. I have never been so well supported. I felt very well prepared to undertake this grave operation. The operation having been decided upon, I suggested that we use the Callison modification approach, which had the advantage of being the procedure I used on the cadaver, which had been witnessed by M. M. Recamier, Brochet and Puyu. After having decided that we must abandon the approach from above, that is to say a laparotomy, it was decided to utilise my idea of a retroperitoneal approach of opening the intestine. Soon everything was ready for the operation, after having been certain that everything was inspected with my aides and in the presence of the consultants, I repeated the steps of the operation such as I had performed many times on cadavers. I then proceeded with the operation. And Amosar goes on to talk about the, the dynamics of the operation, how he proceeded, how the incision was made, but I'll go on to the recovery period afterwards at the end of the operation. The intestinal opening was then brought forward and anteriorly sutured to the skin in four points by averting the mucosa. The first suture was made of an ordinary curved needle and the others were made with acupuncture needles, which I usually employ, and were hardly felt at all. The posterior angle of the wound was reconstructed with sutures. The patient stoically withstood the operation. Immediately afterwards, she was returned to her bed and a simple dressing of an oiled cloth was applied. During the day, the patient felt a great deal of relief. However, she slept very little that night. Frictions made with a mercurial pomade and an extract of belladonna were applied around the wound and then covered with an oiled cloth. On the fifth day, the patient was in the same condition as the previous, with the only complaints from a hernia continuing to be even more painful. The patient complained only of this point in the abdomen and not of the artificial anus. On the 13th of June, Madame D went home to Passé, and on July 21st, I visited her. I found her in the living room with her sister and in a very happy state. She had not the slightest problem since she left Paris. She occasionally felt some pulling in the region of the hernia and some pain in her kidney area. She told me that she had passed gas through her normal anus, which demonstrated to me that the obstruction of the rectum was less than it had been prior to the surgery. The artificial anus performed its functions perfectly. A small discomfort warned her that it was time to defecate, and the patient had experienced diarrhoea only once since being discharged from the hospital. On the contrary, she had a tendency towards constipation. On August 18th, I had a second visit with Madame D. I found her in the same state as I did the first time. She again assured me that gas was passing through her normal rectum, and from August 18 until the present time, which at the time was October 1, four months after the operation, the health of the patient is as satisfactory as possible. All of her bowel functions are performing adequately and the artificial anus is much less inconvenient than one might expect. The patient, who happens to be very fastidious, has learned to live with this infirmary quite well, much better than one would have thought possible. Jeanne Amassat died May 13, 1855, at the age of 58, from complications of diphtheria. However, the procedure for lumbar colostomy would continue to be the preferred procedure in many, many cases and for many, many years to come because that was a safer procedure and it avoided the peritoneum where people thought that they would perforate and get infections and die. 
whereas patients who were undergoing lumbar colostomy were surviving and functioning very well after their operations. Well, that pretty much sums up part one of the Stoma's Horrible Histories episode. Next week's episode, part two, is going to be focusing more on the later parts of the 19th century when the lumbar colostomy started to fall out of fashion again and we start looking at operations to form the ileostomy and the urinary diversion or the urostomy procedures. We're also going to be talking in that episode a little bit more about um, the sterile surgeries that started to come about through the evolution of germ theory, the discovery of different anesthesia so surgeries could be performed longer uh, and less painfully. And then finally, in the last part of part two of Stoma's Horrible Histories, we're going to be looking at a little bit of Australian history and possibly the first created stoma on Australian soil, which is a little bit close to home and I have an affinity for it because it was done in Victoria here. So we're going to be talking about that next week as well. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this podcast. I know it was a long one, but I filled you with fun facts. And now you guys know where the origins of stomas stemmed from in terms of history and surgery. If you like the content that you've listened to today, please feel free to like or leave a comment on iTunes and tune in for other episodes too for the Oz Tommy Nurse Project. You can find us on Spotify, YouTube, Podbean, most places that you get your podcasts you can find us on. Tune in next week, guys, for part two of Stoma's Horrible Histories. This is the Oz Tommy Nurse coming to you from down under, just like where your 300-year-old design stoma is. See you later, everyone. Bye.